Hello and welcome back to Classic Books with Ostara and we are going to tonight we're going to be reading Plato's Republic. We are on book four right there. But when the cobbler or any other man whom nature designed to be a traitor, having his heart lifted up by wealth or strength or the number of his followers, or any like advantage attempts to force his way into the class of warriors or a warrior into that of legislators and, and guardians for which he is unfitted and either to take the implements of the duties or the duties of the other or when one is traitor, legislator, and warrior all in one, then I think you will agree with me in saying that this interchange and this meddling of one with another is the ruin of the state. Most true, seeing that I said that there are three distinct classes, any meddling of one with another or the change of one into another is the greatest harm to the state and may be most justly termed evil doing. So they're basically saying that they want to, if someone happens to be poor, happens to be in a poor station, that's where they want to keep them because they feel like that's meddling with the state. So that's not cool. Precisely, and the greatest degree of evil doing to one's own city would be termed by you injustice. Certainly, this then is injustice, and on the other hand, when the traitor, the auxiliary, and the guardian each do their own business, that is justice, and will make the, just, and will make the city just. I agree with you. We will not, I said, be over-positive as yet, but if on trial this conception of justice be verified, in the individual as well as in the state, there will be no longer any room for doubt if it not be verified. We must have a fresh inquiry. First, let us complete the old investigation which we began, as you remember, under the impression that if we could previously examine justice on the larger scale, there would be less difficulty in discerning her an individual. That larger example appeared to be, in, to be the state. And accordingly, we constructed as good a one as we could, knowing well that in the good state justice would be found. Let the just discovery which we made be now applied to the individual. If they agree, we shall be satisfied, or if there be a difference in the individual, we will come back to the state and have another trial of the theory. The friction of the two when rubbed together may possibly strike a light in which justice will shine forth. And the vision which is then revealed, we will fill, we will fix in our souls. That will be in regular course. Let us do as you say. I proceeded to ask, when two things of greater and a less are called by the same name, as they are, as they like or unlike, in so far as they are called the same. Like he replied, the man, the just man. Then, if we regard the idea of justice only will be like the just state. He will, and a state was thought by us to be just when the three classes in the state severely did their own business and also thought to be temperate and valiant and wise by reason of certain other affections and qualities of these same classes. True, he said. And so the individual, we may assume that he has the same three principles in his own soul, which are found in the state, and he may be rightly described in the same terms because he is affected in the same manner. Certainly, he said, once more then, oh, my friend, we have alighted upon an easy question whether the soul has these three principles or not. An easy question? Nay, Ray, rather, Socrates. The proverb holds that hard is the good. Very true, I said, and I do not think that the method with which we are employing is at all adequate to the accurate solution of this question. The true method is another and a longer one. Still, we may arrive at a solution not below the level of the previous inquiry. May we not be satisfied with that, he said, under the circumstances I am quite content. I too, I replied, shall be extremely well satisfied. Then faint not in pursuing the speculation, he said. Must we not acknowledge, I said, that in each of these, uh, uh, in each of us, there are the same principles and habits which there are in the state, 
and that from the individual they pass into the state. How else can they come there? Take the quality of passion or spirit. It would be ridiculous to imagine that this quality, when found in states, is not derived from the individuals who are supposed to possess it, e.g. the Thracians, Scythians, and in general, the northern nations. And in the same may be said are the love of knowledge, which is a special characteristic of our part of the world, or the love of money, which may, with equal truth, be attributed to the Phoenicians and Egyptians. Exactly so, he said. There is no difficulty in understanding this, none whatever. But the question is not quite so easy when we proceed to ask whether these principles are three or one, whether that, that is to say, we learn with one part of our nature, are angry with another, and with a third part desire the satisfaction of our nature, natural appetites, or whether the whole soul comes into play in each sort of action to determine that is the difficulty. Then let us now try and determine whether they are the same or different. How can we, he asked. I replied as follows. The same thing clearly cannot act or be acted upon in the same part or in relation to the same thing at the same time in contrary ways. And therefore, whenever this contradiction occurs in things apparently the same, we know that they are really not the same but different. Good. For example, I said, can the same thing be at rest and in motion at the same time in the same part? Impossible. Still, I said, let us have a more precise statement of terms, lest we should hereafter fall out by the way. Imagine the case of a man who is standing and also moving his hands, his head, and suppose a person to say that one and the same person is in motion at, and at rest at the same moment. To such a mode of speech, we should object, and should rather say that one part of him is in motion while an another is at rest. Very true. And suppose the objector to refine still further and to draw the nice distinction that not only parts of type, tops, but whole tops, when they spin round their pegs fixed on the spot, are at rest and are in motion at the same time, and he may say the same of anything which revolves in the same spot, his objection would not be admitted by us because in such cases things are not at rest and in motion in the same parts of themselves. We should rather say that they have both an axis and a circumference and that the axis stands still, for there is no devi deviation from, from the perpendicular, and that the circumference goes round, but if while revolving, the axis inclines either to the right or left, forward or backward, then in no point of view can they be at rest. This is a correct mode of describing them, he replied. Then none of these objections will confuse us or, or incline us to believe that the same thing at the same time, the same part or in relation to the same thing, can act or be acted upon in contrary ways. Certainly not, according to my way of thinking. Yet yeah, I said that we may not be compelled to examine all such objections and prove at length that they are untrue. Let us assume their absurdity and go forward on the understanding that hereafter, if this assumption turn out to be untrue, all the consequences which follow shall be withdrawn. Yes, he said, that will be the best way. Well, I said, would you not allow that assent and dissent, desire and aversion, attraction and repulsion, are all of them opposites, whether they are regarded as active or passive, for that makes no difference in the fact of their opposition. Yes, he said, they are opposites, well, I said, and hunger and thirst and the desires in general, and again willing and wishing, all these you would refer to the classes already mentioned. You would say, would you not, that the soul of him who desires is seeking after the object of his desire, or that he is drawing to himself the thing which he wishes to possess. Or again, when a person wants anything to be given him, his mind, longing for the realization of his desire, intimates his wish to have it by a nod of assent, as if he had been asked a question. Very true. And what would you say of unwillingness and dislike in the absence of desire, 
Should not these be referred to the opposite class of repulsion and rejection? Certainly. Since these things are so, shall we say them that there is a distinct class of desires in the soul and that the most conspicuous of these are the ones we call hunger and thirst? Let's take that class, he said. The object of one is food and of the other drink. Yes. And here comes the point is not thirst, the desire which the soul has of drink and of drink only, of drink, not of drink qualified by anything else. For example, warm or cold or much or little, or in a word drink of any particular sort, but if the thirst be accompanied by heat, then the desire is of cold drink, but if accompanied by cold, then of warm drink, or if the thirst be excessive, then the drink which is desired will be excessive, or if not great, the quantity of drink will also be small, but thirst pure and simple will desire drink pure and simple, which is the natural of satisfaction of thirst, as food is of hunger. Yes, he said, the simple desire is as, is, as you say, in every case of the simple object, and the qualified desire the qualified object. But here a confusion may arise, and I should wish to guard against an opponent starting up and saying that no man desires drink only, but good drink, or food only, but good food, for good is the universal object of desire, and thirst being a desire will necessarily be thirst after good drink. And the same is true of every other desire. Yes, he replied, the opponent might have something to say. Nevertheless, I should still maintain that of relatives, some have a quality attached to either term of the relation. Others are simple and have their correlatives simple. I mean, I do not know what you mean. Well, you know, of course, that the greater is relative to the less, certainly, and the much greater to the much less, yes, and the sometime greater to the sometime less. The greater that is to be less is to be to the less that is to be, certainly, he said, and so of more or less and of other correlative terms such as the double and the half or again, the heavier and light, the lighter, the swifter and the slower. And of hot and cold, and of any other relatives, is not this true of all of them? Yes, and does not the same principle hold in the sciences? The object of science is knowledge, assuming that to be the true definition. But the object of a particular science is a particular kind of knowledge. I mean, for example, that the science of house building is a kind of knowledge which is defined, distinguished from other kinds, and is therefore termed architecture. Certainly, because it has a particular quality which no other has. And it has this particular quality because it has an object of a particular kind, and this is true, the other arts and sciences. Yes, now then, if I have made myself clear, you will understand my original meaning in what I said about relatives. My meaning was that if one term of a, re of a relation is taken alone, the other is taken alone. If one term is qualified, the other is also qualified. I do not mean to say that relatives may not be disparate or that the science of health is healthy or of disease necessarily diseased, or that the science of good and evil are therefore good and evil, only that when the term science is no longer used absolutely, but has a qualified object, which in this case is the nature of health and disease, it becomes defined and is hence called not merely science, but the science of medicine. I quite understand, and I think as you do. Would you not say that thirst is one of these essentially relative terms, having clearly a relation? What's the next page here? Here we go. Yes, thirst is relative to drink. And a certain kind of thirst is relative to a certain kind of drink. But thirst taken alone is neither much nor little, nor of good nor bad, nor of any particular kind of drink, but a drink alone, certainly. Then the soul of the thirsty one, in so far as he is thirsty, desires only drink, for this he yearns and tries to obtain it. That is plain. And if you suppose something which pulls a thirsty soul away from drink, that must be different from the thirsty principle which draws him like a beast to drink. For as we were saying, the same thing cannot at the same time, the same part of itself, 
act in contrary ways about the uh, same. Impossible. No more than you can say that the hands of the archer push and pull the bow at the same time. But what you say is that one hand pushes and the other hand pulls. Exactly so, he replied. And might a man be thirsty and yet unwilling to drink? Yes, he said, it constantly happens. And in such a case, what is one to say? Would you not say that there was something in the soul bidding a man to drink and something else forbidding him, which is other and stronger than the principle of which bids him? I should say so. And the forbidding principle is derived from reason, and that which bids and attracts proceeds from passion and disease. Clearly. Then we may now fairly assume that they are two, and that they differ from one another. The other, the one with which a man reasons, we may call the rational principle of the soul. The other, which, which he loves and hungers and thirsts, and feels the flutterings of any other desire, may be termed the irrational or appetite of the ally of sundry pleasures and satisfactions. Yes, he said, we may fairly assume that to be different, them to be different. Then let us accordingly determine that there are two principles existing in the soul. And what of passion or spirit? Is it a third or akin to one of the proceedings? I should be inclined to say akin to desire. Well, I said, there is a story which I remember to have heard in which I put faith. The story is that Leontius, the son of Aglaon, coming up one day from the Piraeus under the north wall on the outside, observed some dead bodies lying on the ground at the place of ex execution. He felt a desire to see them, and also a dread and abhorrence of them. For a time he struggled and covered his eyes. But at length the desire did, got the better of him, and forcing them open, he ran up to the dead body, saying, Look, ye wretches, take your fill of the fair sight. I have heard the story myself, he said. The moral of the tale is that anger at times goes to war with desire, as though they were two distinct things. Yes, that is the meaning, he said. And are there not many other cases in which we observe that when a man's desires violently prevail under his reason, he reviles himself and is angry at the violence within him? and that in this struggle, which is like the struggle of factions and a state, his spirit is on the side of his reason, but for the passionate or spirited element to take part with the desires, when reason decides that it should not be opposed, is a sort of thing which I believe that you never observed according in yourself, occurring in yourself, nor as I should imagine in anyone else. Suppose that a man thinks he has done a wrong to another, the nobler he is, the less able he is to feel indignant or any or at any suffering, such as hunger or cold or any other pain, which the injured person may inflict upon him. These he deems to be just, and as I say, his anger refuses to be excited by them. True, he said, but when he thinks that he is the sufferer of the wrong, then he boils and chafes, and is on the side what he believes to be justice, and because he suffers hunger or cold or other pain, he is only the more determined to persevere and conquer. His noble spirit will not be quelled until he either slays or is slain, or until he hears the voice of the shepherd that is reason, bidding his dog bark no more. The illustration is perfect, he replied, and in our state, as we were saying, the auxiliaries were to be dogs, and to hear the voice of the rulers were who are their shepherds, I perceive, I said that you quite understand me. There is, however, a further point which I wish you, could, you to consider. What point? You remember that passion or spirit appeared at first sight to be a kind of desire, but now we should say quite the contrary, for in the conflict of the soul spirit is arrayed on the side of the nat rational principle. Most assuredly, but a further question arises. Is passion different from reason also? Also a kind of reason in which latter case set of three principles in the soul, there will only be two, the rational and the concupiscent, or rather, as the state was composed of three classes, traitors, auxiliaries, counselors, so may there not be in the individual soul a third element, which is passion or spirit, and when not corrupted by bad education, is the natural auxiliary of reason. 
Yes, he said. There must be a third. Yes, I replied. If passion, which has already been shown to be different from desires, turn out also to be different from reason. But that is easily proved. We may observe, even in young children, that they are full of spirit almost as soon as they are born, where some of them see never seem to attain to the use of reason, and most of them less late enough. Excellent, I said, and you may see passion equally in brute animals, which is a further proof of the truth of what you were saying, and we may once more appeal to the words of Homer, which have been already quoted by us. For in this verse, Homer has clearly supposed the power which reasons about the better and worse to be different from the unreason and anger which is rebuked by it. Very true, he said, and so after much tossing, we have reached land and are fairly agreed that the same principles which exist in the state exist also in the individual, and that they are three in number exactly. Must we not then infer that the individual is wise in the same way, and in virtue of the same quality which makes the state wise? Certainly, also that the same quality which constitutes courage in the, sa in the state constitutes courage in the individual, and that both the state and the individual bear the same relation to all the other virtues. Surely, and the individual will be, will be acknowledged by us to be just in the same way in which the state is just. That follows, of course. We cannot but remember that the justice of the state consisted in each of the three classes doing the work of its own class. <clears throat> we are not very likely to have forgotten, he said. We must recollect that the individual in whom the several qualities of his nature do their own work be just and will do his own work. Yes, he said, we must remember that too, and not, not the rational principle which is wise and has the care of the whole soul to rule, and the passionate or spirited principle to be the subject and ally. Certainly. And as we were saying, the united influence of music and gymnastics will bring them into accord, nerving and sustaining the reason with noble words and lessons, and moderating and soothing and civilizing the wildness of passion by harmony and rhythm. Quite true, he said. And these two, thus nurtured and educated, and having learned truly to the, know their own functions, will rule over the concupiscent, which in each of us is the largest part of the soul, and by nature most insatiable of gain. Over this they will keep guard, lest waxing great and strong with the fullness of body, bodily pleasures, as they are termed. The concupiscent soul no longer confined to her own sphere, should attempt to enslave and rule those who are not her natural-born subjects and overturn the whole life of man. Very true, he said. Both together will they not be the best defenders of the whole soul and the whole body against attacks from without, the one counseling and the other fighting under his leader and courageously executing his commands and counsels. True, and he is to be deemed Courageous, whose spirit retains in pleasure and in pain the commands of reason about what he is ought, he ought or ought not to be. Right, he replied. And I'm going to end right there. We only have a few more pages in book four, but we will be in, in the next video. We will do. We will finish out book four, and then we will summarize and analyze. So, till next. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to hit the like button, subscribe, and comment below. Be sure to hit the notification bell, and also stay tuned for, as I said, Plato's Republic, the, the ending to book four, and summary and analysis.